instead of going through a very technical talk, I thought, you know, I'll just construct my presentation around four predictions. And uh, these predictions come out of my experience of having worked essentially at France Telecom for a few years in the machine to machine department. It was a clandestino group really. Nobody was supposed to know that we're doing actually research on cell uh, on, on, on sensor networks, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, because the uh, operator's core business was clearly uh, the voice and data calls. So that was one part of my, my background. The other part is once I joined actually, uh, you know, the team in, in Barcelona, I founded my, I co-founded my own company called World Sensing, which is a, a machine to machine business. And we are now 25, 30 people with an office in Barcelona and in, in London and a nice um, acquisition on the horizon. So this is going pretty well. And so these four predictions come out of that experience over the past 10 years, really. Prediction number one, that's a pure technology prediction. Now, when it comes to M2M, machine-to-machine technologies, I think we have a few con con contestants here. So the most traditional one is the kind of Zigbee family, the 802.15.4 family uh, who could deal with uh, sensor, sensor networks, etc. The second one which is emerging is uh, Wi-Fi. The third one is proprietary cellular, just like uh, Noel, we had heard about uh, William talking about this before. And the fourth one is clearly cellular M2M, which has been around actually traditionally for quite some years. Now, my prediction is even though the M2M community, the wireless sensor network community, etc., has put most of their cards on the on the uh, Zigbee type of developments, 802.15.4 type of systems, as an enormous ecosystem behind there, I think this system will just die out over a few years. And I have learned it the hard way, hard way with my company because we had a lot of problems with that type of system. We designed, I was part of the team who designed the 15.4 um, Zigbee stack. And uh, I was also part of the system in France Telecom which decided to leave specifically this particular standards group because we realized it is just not good enough from a technology point of view to do what this type of technology is supposed to do. Uh, a very simple example is that the whole mesh networking didn't work because Zigbee was really short range, so you needed multi-hop type of uh, uh, topologies. Academics love multi-hop. I, you know, I was keynoting two years ago, precisely in this venue here, saying you know ad hoc is dead, and uh, it came out of this uh, rational really that uh, whilst the academia loves this multi-hop game, publishing a lot of papers with uh, loads of degrees of freedom, when it comes to real industrial application where you really need to roll out something in the field, so it runs for 10 years uh, without any reboot, without anybody going there and actually maintaining the solution, things change completely. And uh, the, the, best, the best hit I've done as CTO of World Sensing is to get rid of anything related to multi-hop and rather focus on the on the one hop technology. So therefore I think you know even though this ecosystem is big it is not huge and I think it will run out uh, sh very shortly will run out of power. So that's one of the things I'm observing in the community. What is emerging instead? It's emerging uh, something which we never thought would emerge it's it's Wi-Fi. You know Wi-Fi Wi-Fi has a has uh, some really nice properties. The biggest uh, advantage is you don't have coverage problems. So this is what I had with Zigbee. With Zigbee, we always had the problem is how do we provide coverage to a Zigbee node? Now with Bluetooth, we got around this problem by just stuffing you know, Bluetooth modules into every single mo mobile. In the end, we got kind of a critical mass to, bo uh, to boost it up this type of ecosystem. Zigbee didn't have that luxury and France Silicon suffered from that. So when I was there, we were part of the team which introduced you know, a little dongle to the live box, which is the Wi-Fi box in France, in France where I sell there, uh, with the idea that people could build their intelligent home network. 2007, okay? 2007 that was. I think they discontinued that in 2009, 2010, because of course nobody bought it. There's no critical mass, there was no coverage, there were no, there was exactly the problem which William mentioned, you know, the problem of the two ends. So Wi-Fi doesn't have that problem. Everybody knows about Wi-Fi. You know, you go to uh, the down to Stockholm, you ask people what is uh, Zigbee, they would know. You ask them what is Wi-Fi, they do know what it is. So I switch on my Wi-Fi network, I see like 16 stations. So there's no problem if I had a chip which would be able to connect my sensors, my actuators with a Wi-Fi module. Well, you know, the biggest problem I have in my company providing coverage um, is just solved. 
and these chips are coming. So Gainspan is producing these chips, Qualcomm is producing these chips because they've realized that there's enormous opportunity of running this Internet of Things, this future machine-to-machine -machine networks, etc., on Wi-Fi, a system we understand really well. People argue it's not as power efficient as uh, Zigbee is. That's true. It's not as power efficient, but power is never a problem. Power has never been the problem. Power doesn't drain your battery. Energy drains your battery. So it turns out this is actually more energy efficient. Okay, so if you want to send a certain uh, packet of a certain length, it turns out that Wi-Fi, if you design it really well, is 10 times more energy efficient than Zigbee. This system we thought is the most energy efficient system on the planet. And Bosch has done these studies, so we have these slides. I have them in my more, more technical slides. So Wi-Fi has it all, all it takes to really take off. It has the technical capabilities, it has the critical mass, it has an ecosystem of companies building up, really building machine-to-machine -machine type of technology on this low-power Wi-Fi, and it's happening, it will happen. It's happening now more in the consumer space because people have Wi-Fi at home, so Disney, Disney is looking at that. They want to build dolls which are intelligent, which interact. Um, loads of these type of consumer products. That's happening. What else is happening in the world? Well, we have a lot of propriety uh, cellular systems coming out. They're beautiful because they just rid me of uh, the big problem of coverage. I can tell you we had a, we had a very big procurement process in, um, in Moscow, which in the end we won that project. We're supposed to uh, provide smart parking, smart city application over all Moscow. And the problem was that if we used this type of Zigbee or Wi-Fi type of technology, you had to mount gateways, gateways and repeaters. Now, to start with, Moscow doesn't have any uh, uh, lamppost where you could mount it. And if it did have, the two departments of the lightning and the, the parking space would, would just talk to each other. Okay, so what we introduced there is the cellular type of technology, and because cellular wasn't wasn't ready yet at that time, we used a propriety cellular technology similar to 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 Noel's type of technology. Now the the trend here is there are two cams of propriety technologies coming. One is the really narrow band solution. So the idea is to squeeze really the bandwidth so narrow that you capture very little noise, and the link budgets are like 140, 150 dB. In fact, they're so good link budgets that you could talk to a satellite. Okay, it happened. So we have our base station in Barcelona. My CEO was flying with a plane over France, over Paris, and they could actually talk to each other. Okay, so this is possible. And uh, the other trend is the TV white space companies like Noel, which is really building you know, this technology, which is not necessarily looking at low power, it's high power but low energy because they do the business very quickly. So they duty cycle the nodes and uh, they get essentially the battery lifetime of, of, of 10 years. Now the problem with these companies, and we still have to see how this plays out, is, is the business model is not proven. It really is not proven today. And uh, that may explain why there are no big players actually in this, in this space, because they're just still observing what's happening there. So we had a lot of VC funds, um, Noel had VC funds, the other companies I'm, I'm, I'm aware of had a lot of VC funding, so it's kind of powering the whole party, but nobody has actually really made sufficient money out of the M2M uh, data plants. Okay? And in fact, a company we, we work with until now, um, not Noel, another company, is doing business not with the data which is flowing through the system, but by selling base stations. Okay, this is how they do business today. I know, of course, it's not enough to actually pay the whole, the whole party. So they need VC funding all the time. So we'll see how this plays out. And uh, the, the big mistake I see playing out is that these type of companies are trying to be three things in one. They're trying to provide the actual radio modules. They're trying to provide the coverage, so be a, an operator. And they're trying to power also their own applications. Okay, so it's, it's three in one. So they're a manufacturer, they're an operator, and they are a, a service provider with very specific verticals. Now, this, this is not going to end up well. Okay, so they need to make a decision at some point. Otherwise, they're going to end up like Yahoo, who couldn't decide what exactly they are, whether they're a search engine or, or content provider. So here it goes. So we'll see how it goes. So personally, I think M2M, and maybe this is not a big surprise to this crowd here. Normally to the crowd I talk to, it's a big surprise, but I think M2M, the long-term contender, is really cellular. It's the cellular M2M as we know it. Whether it is ideal, you know, Rahim was saying it's maybe not so ideal, the interface we have today or in 4G 
in terms of scalability, etc. We will work on that. We will sort this out. But the fact that we have an ecosystem here of companies which really push for that, that we have global coverage, that we have roaming capabilities, handover capabilities, just makes it exactly what I need as a company, an M2M company, because I don't want to care about that. I have a lot of headache of providing coverage. I have a lot of headache of providing all these service plans. I just want to run my business. I want to attack certain verticals, you know, and just use the technology which is there. So we, we love that cellular M2M. The only problem was that three years ago when I started talking to these, uh, to these uh, operators all around the world, we had a misunderstanding on how we should run the, the, the business. So I'm going to come to that in a later prediction. So as a summary, it's not about technology. Somebody said it. I really don't think it's about technology today anymore. It's really about critical mass. And not all of these systems which are out there do have critical mass. It's also about standards. I agree with uh, William on that. So we observe that not all technologies we standardize will make it, but those technologies which have made it typically are standardized. So it's, it's that relationship which you need to observe. Now, the, the prediction on the likely loser, that's now about the servicing. I have put in the background a slide from General Electric. They call the whole M2M ecosystem the, the industrial internet for a very good reason. And they said, if we use M2M, that means real-time data capability from the field. And we optimized different verticals by just a single percent, we could make enormous gains. Oil and gas, 90 billion, transportation, healthcare, these are very heavy verticals. Just 1%. I, I'm in one of these no verticals, a transportation vertical, and I can tell you we are much better than 1%. So the, the, you know, the gains are actually much larger than what General Electric has been projecting here. So who gets the pie? And I think, unfortunately, the, 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 the operators will not be part of this whole pack, which will actually make money out of that. Why? Simply because out of philosophy, probably, I don't know, it's a people thing. William said it, I completely agree, it's a people thing. So the operators were operators 20 years ago. They were not able to make the shift to service providers 10 years ago, and I doubt they will be able to make the shift to machine-to-machine -to -machine service provider today or in the next years. So companies like Noil don't have to worry about this. I think it will not happen, simply because you have the people with the old mindset there. And I have this problem. I was uh, four years ago, three years ago, I was telling the guys, look, we're running out an M2M network of uh, 65,000 nodes in Moscow. Make me a good offer. 65,000 nodes, M2M, this is like you don't get this ev every day. They told me, okay, one euro 50 per node and uh, 200 megabytes of data per month. So I don't need this. I don't need 200 megabytes. I'm sending parking information. The place is occupied or not occupied. It's a bit. I encrypt it, okay, 16 byte, but it's just so little. And I can't pay one euro 50. I want to pay five cents. You know what, actually, give it to me for free. Just, you know, don't charge me for the, for the data pipe. I'll give you the data. You work on the data contents. Do whatever money you want to do out of this, but give me the pipe for free because I cannot sustain my own business model on paying such a high. So there was no way we could have, you know, agreed on that. Things gotten better. So we're now back on the negotiation table, and I think this will work out nicely. But the, the actual, you know, the ability to capitalize on the data content rather than the data pipe just has not happened. Okay? There are a few operators who manage to half-label them through to a service provider. France Telecom is one of them. Um, Telefonica, Vodafone, etc. But in the end, you know, if you look exactly at their service platforms, they're not really service platforms. They're middleware platforms, actually, in the actual sense. They're just aggregating different technologies, outputting some standard stuff, and then you can play with that. This is not really servicing in the sense of attacking a very specific vertical. So they're still a very long way off. Another problem they have, they have been in B2C all the time. The real low-hanging fruits are on B2B. Oil and gas. This is not a consumer thing. This is like a, a big boy's thing. And these are the low-hanging fruits. And rather, you see companies like Telefonica running things, or France Telecom, let me give you that example, because I worked for them. We did in 2007 this rabbit. We did a rabbit for home. You know, We tried to kind of make it attractive to the, to the consumers, an electronic rabbit which would move its ear when somebody came home, whatever. You know, I mean, they're playing around. These are toys, whilst the opportunity is in the back of this slide. 
So this shift from B to C to B to B is, is uh, some some operators have a big problem with that another shift which is happening occurring in general in this society is the shift from capex to to opex. So more and more things come x as a service. So you want to you want to offer something on a monthly subscription fee rather than just you know sell off the hardware and that's the end of the story. Whereas you know operators are interested just you know you you sell something you sell infrastructure whatever and get it going. So this shift is going. Another problem I see is actually maybe really a design problem, and this is maybe the message to the future internet designers in this room. By making our network flat, we have shot ourselves in, in the food, really. We, we, it's, not a, it's not a criticism, it's just an observation, really, here. So I think, you know, whilst having an IP-enabled network allows us a sensor to talk to a a sensor in, in, in Stockholm to talk to a supercomputer center in Australia, that's possible. At the same time, we have decoupled really the technology from the ability to make money out of this technology. Okay, so the, there is no differentiation of a packet, you know, which belongs to Skype, to Twitter, to LinkedIn, etc., going through this network. So whilst you know the operators has to bring up the infrastructure, they cannot possibly even technically uh, piggyback on the value of the data which goes through. So if you want to scale this uh, this community, just have an IP future IP packet which has a value bit in there, or whatever, and this will happen. So this happened two years ago. Telefonica signed with Google uh, a contract where Google would actually pay part of the infrastructure which Tele Telefonica was rolling out. This makes sense, because Google is using that infrastructure, making money out of that. And, uh, you know, this money should come back in one way or another. But it would be interesting to piggyback that directly into the, into the data flow. Now, coming to the winners. The likely winners on machine-to-machine -machine will likely be the integrators of integrators, you know, the data analytics companies. I've put up some names which you're familiar with. I could put up some names which you're not familiar with and which are also running the show here. So I put up the IBMs, uh, the Oracles, uh, the SAPs. I could have put up, you know, the Capitas, the Logicas, which I'm sure you've never heard of. So these are the type of companies which, uh, which really are able to absorb very heterogeneous data streams. We talk about big data, it's not necessarily about the volume of data, it's about the heterogeneity, about the quality of data. They're able to uh, aggregate that and really put some intelligence on that. So we worked with IBM quite a lot, and I'll give you an example in a moment. And that works really, really well. And these are the ones which will really make the big cash out of this. And, uh, on, and these are the companies which look from above into the M2M field. But actually the data is generated really in the field. You know, they are the Schlumbergis, you know, the BPs, the shells, they generate a lot of data in the field. They're the Telvens, which you have never heard of. Uh, the, uh, whatever companies out there which are actually owning the traditional field, the physical infrastructure, the cables, the, the, uh, the, the, the power infrastructure, etc. They are the ones which will actually be using, you know, these uh, sensor modules, the actuation models. They're the ones who actually create all the data. But they're just too down there at the moment. So there's a big struggle with the companies which are in the field, the Schlumbergis, the Telvens, etc., which you have never heard of because you're not in this space. And then you have the companies on top, which you have heard of, the uh, IBMs and the, uh, the Oracles and the SAPs. So th there's a shift of the, of the ownership happening right now. And you see that with smart cities, and this is where my company is in, really. So there's a big, big uh, struggle between these companies. They're the companies which have been painting parking lanes, putting parking machines, uh, you know, charging people for ticketing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this was their business. And uh, they were in the field. And now suddenly IBM comes in and says, hey, I can run your whole city so much more efficient if you give me all the data from the parking stuff, from the traffic, weather information, sports information, and suddenly, you know, we can, we can actually leverage so much more uh, in terms of services in the city than what just this single parking company could do before. And you see that London's congestion charge is run by IBM. Okay, now they handed it over, but uh, it's always a service company. So we see this shift uh, happening. So the shift is really going into the big players here with the big disadvantages that it's a very, very expensive club to be in. Okay, and that, that actually 
uh, goes straight into my into my fourth prediction because it's so, such an expensive club to be in the uptake of m2m will be so much sm slower than what we think it, it 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 should be so we have seen predictions of i don't know 20 billion devices by 2020 uh, you know, 50 billion devices, Ericsson, I think, fired this out, 50 billion devices by, I don't know when, 2030. I think it will just has to, it will have to wait. Simply because, as you have understood, the ones who could really make this happen, the SAPs, the Oracles, etc., you know, are big companies. They have a revenue stream coming from different things. So, you know, the IBMs uh, sell mainframes, etc. Until they realize that there's a major business in the M2M space, like a major one, and they will, uh, it, a few years will pass, and you really need these companies to realize it, to really push for the deployment of this technology, maybe even with a zero CAPEX model, so they would subsidize the rollout of M2M just to get the, uh, the data and work on the data, okay? So the, 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 the IBMs and the SAPs and the Oracles, they have a lot of time, because their money comes from somewhere else. Companies like Williams Company and my company, we don't have time because we run out of cash. We have a cash flow problem, very serious one. And uh, so the M2M market uh, happens to be, you know, kind of run by the big guys whose major income comes from somewhere else. And the innovation happens with small companies who have struggle, who struggle with the long sales cycles. So you have two choices as a small company or you die or you scale very quickly beyond being a startup. So I don't think Noel would qualify themselves as a startup anymore, nor do we. So we have scaled with VC money, et cetera, now with sales, but you can't do otherwise. So that's very important for any company, any innovative company being in this, in this space. And you know, this struggle between the big ones who have, have no hurry at all and the small ones who can't break the circle, um, that will probably dictate the M2M ecosystem for quite a while, and we will need to see whether really by 2030 we will have, you know, 35, 50 billion of devices rolled out, up and running and pulsating this, this planet. So that's it from my side. Thank you. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure there must be some questions and uh, comments on this. Lauri. Thanks. Uh, I, th I think there has been one uh, attempt in Europe to make this um, feel more level and, and get it going faster by getting uniformity and platforms in there. And I'm referring to the future Internet PPP, um, which I'm sure. So, so do you think that will succeed in any way in that file we're providing co common components and actually getting this kind of going? Well, it's, am I being filmed on that? Yes. So <laughs> um, I think, you know, the good thing about the European projects in general is that they are very good for education. Whether they're very good for innovation and really making things happen is a different story, but at least with the uh, PPPs we understood uh, where the problems are because it hasn't worked out very clearly. Okay? Um, big companies have used that money to train their people and also to subsidize the development of these middleware platforms. So this has happened. It has helped the economy in a, in a sense, but it has not proven the business model. It has not proven it's really able to run and generate money on its own. And uh, because uh, the major, you know, the, the, the winners of these PPPs, financially speaking, were companies we are familiar with from the ICT sector. But the ones who really well, like, will use that type of technology come out of that. So they have been attempting to bring in these external stakeholders. But I'm not sure this played out so, so well, simply because they're not familiar with the same language. So that, that was a, I think there's a kind of transition learning phase now. We'll see how this plays out. But from a training point of view, I think that was very important, as all European projects. Gerhard? Well, I think for M to M to really pick up, we have to have it in cellular, as you do, as you said. But for that, we need a new cellular standard because we need to run it off a AAA battery for 10 years, a device transmitting 25 bytes every 100 seconds. This is sort of a standard in the M to M business. And if you do the back of the envelope calculation, it can be done. It's physically not infeasible. Okay. There's more than a 3 dB uh, I mean, battery loss that mm -hmm. you can also account for. So you can do it on 500 milliamp hour, not the 1,000 milliamp hour that a AAA battery has. At the same time, that also means that off a one euro coin, 
solar cell, you could run this device infinitely long. This means every single flower plant, whatever all can have its little device in mm -hmm. there. But we have to ch change the protocol around completely. Yes, so not the base station controls when the mobile mm. uh, is allowed to talk, but the mobile basically mm. dominates the base station. So these kind of things, mm. I think, are major important, let's say, specifications that we have to put into a 5G system. Mm -hmm. And then M2M really takes up speed. So far, we're just seeing that it's too power hungry. And and uh, also, I mean, another issue is, of course, the billing plans. There's some major innovation happening in charging and billing, uh, which are happening now over the last two or three months, that will also spike a whole big yeah, wave right. in M to M. I, I agree with you on the uh, I agree with you on the on the billing thing, but I'm not so sure about the battery life and the technology anymore. I mean I understand you need to earn your bread and you know maybe you have some nice ideas in the background. But having run now well sensing for a while, I think Battery life is not the major driver anymore. In fact, you know, when we sold it in China, they would never ask because they have no problems. You know, they have enough personnel to actually change batteries. As long as your battery runs for 18 months, 14, 18 months in the verticals we are in, there's no problem. And the cellular technology I'm exposed with today can do that. But the, the, major, the major problem are the billing plans because uh, you know, I could not possibly have a business model which we had to change, uh, pay like a euro 50 per node. So we'll see how that goes. I think the technology side becomes really complex once you really scale up. But for the initial rollouts now of what, 100,000 sensors, that should be okay. I really think so. Yes, yes. But we need to bootstrap it. That's a problem. It's not even bootstrapped yet. Mm -hmm. mm. Klaus? Yeah, I um, kind of agree here, but I just want to start with a famous quote from the f movie Jerry Maguire, show me the money. And I think that's, that's really the main problem here. In Sweden we've had m to m companies and operators for at least the last 15 years. Wireless Mangate is one example. Wireless Mangate has uh, around 4 million SIM cards out in Sweden. They actually are sort of uh, using Teliasonora's network. Teliasonora also has 4 million SIM cards in Sweden. Uh, on those 4 million SIM cards, uh, um, uh, Wireless Maingate makes 100 million Swedish crowns per year. Is that a lot or little? That's nothing. That's okay. what that's right. what Telia Sonra makes in in <laughs> in four hours on on their on their cellular customers. So it's uh, <laughs> revenue, revenue. So so it's uh, it's. I tell you what the problem is. The problem is because they're again a horizontal. The, the value is, I, I, I don't have it here. Yeah, here. but, but here. I have... Yeah, the, the value is in the vertical. Yeah, but I have an objection about these, because the, these, these verticals show up all the time when we discuss this. But the thing is that these are not new money. These are, are sort of money that ex are expected, sort of, that we can, so in some way, sort of gain by rationalizing our industries. But we don't. When, when industry are rationalizing, they don't make more money because there's a competition in these industry at the same time. So no one will ever make those 90 billion in, in oil and gas, because all the, diff all the oil companies are at the same time doing the same rationalization. Yeah. What we need for machine to machine to work is new money, new markets, Things like innovation and, and or services like Spotify. I tell you, people pay I agree with you. I agree with you. Just to, I see your point. So I agree with you. I, I, I share completely your vision. You know, when you look at our our work on how to bootstrap the M2M market, it's exactly down this line. Now that's why in the smart city market we went specifically for one or two applications which generate cash. They're not making the city more efficient. They generate cash. And the oil and gas where we are in, with the network we provide. The whole crew cost for seismic acquisition goes down by 20, 30 percent. So they can use that money to put a denser network, get better resolution, and just you know pump out more oil. And that's a, that's a big thing. So you need to s understand also the drivers behind this. Some markets have a very strong driver, but in general, I agree with you. You need to come up with something which generates extra cash on the use of uh, that M2M technology. Yes. Um, may I add a comment on the um, why things take time? Mm -hmm. um, um, cyber physical systems, um, and they have this uh, property that actually controls something in, in, in the physical world. 
Um, we have been very effective in um, human to human communication to, to remote ourselves from the wor world as much as we can. We have very standardized platforms that look, my terminal looks, ex the uh, software platform looks exactly as, as the terminal of, of Gerald. So you can, applications run on my terminal as just as on Gerald's on your terminal. Um, so, so they, and they work in billions of terminals all over the world. The cyber physical world is different in every place. And uh, so if you want to control the system, um, you have to know about something about the system. And it actually, it doesn't help you to, to sprinkle it with sensors. You know everything about the system, but if you can't do anything with the system, it doesn't matter that you know all the temperatures and pressures everywhere, and, and it doesn't help you. I had a very good example. I was working for the S Defense Research Institute, and th they uh, wanted to, I mean, in, in they have been in M2M as well. They call it uh, global situation awareness meaning that you have sensors everywhere, so you know everything about the surroundings, wh where you want to attack with your tank company, and you get in all this information. And then the, c the commanders, uh, how, how do they fight the war? Uh, they do exactly the same as before, just that they have a lot of more information that confuses them. Uh, so uh, there's no real, uh, no real rethinking in how you actually would organize in, in a tank battalion or something like that because of you have all this information. They always think, and we do the same thing, but a little bit better, we can send telegrams a little bit faster. The same with the steel mill. You can know exactly what goes on in the steel mill, but if you're, if you're not prepared to sort of re-engineer the steel mill, having all this knowledge, uh, you don't get make the, really the big gains. And I think that will take a lot of time. Yeah. To, the next time you build yeah. a steel mill, you will yes. do it completely differently. Yes. But refitting, I think, is the, m the gains will only be marginal. Mm. Do you agree with that? Yes, I completely agree. I, I'm not familiar with these markets, but in the, in the smart city, I see that mm. because we take data streams from the parking, data streams from the from the traffic flow, the weather information, and the sports information. So we know when, or oh, and Twitter feeds IBM takes as well, etc. So we know exactly when, when, and where the problem zones. Now, okay, that's one part of the pie. The question is now, how do you re-engineer the city so you make it more efficient? You tell people, don't go here, uh, don't go there, go there, park here, etc. It's a, it's a completely different story. So yeah, the engineering, the more active part of using that data to do something is uh, probably piggybacks in the observation that you know it will really be the one which creates the value in the end of the day. So we'll take a time. Okay. All right. Um. No further questions, I guess it's time to discuss in the M2M panel session as well. So thanks again, Michel. Thanks.